God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit existed in a mysterious triune reality of glory before anything was created. Before there was a heaven, before there were angels, and before our physical universe came into being, there was just God in his glory. That was the only reality. Jesus told his disciples that he shared this glory with the Father before the world was ever created. See John 17:5. At some point in eternity past, God decided to extend the reality of his glory beyond the Godhead. The perfect love that was shared in the Trinity could not be contained in the shared reality of glory. So God developed a plan to grow the family. It was the love of God that initiated the whole idea, and it is the love of God that is manifested in the created reality. In other words, the purpose of creation and the ultimate goal of creation are to reveal God's love to his creatures. In order to create other living beings, God decided to use a substance to make them. However, God would not share his divine essence with his creatures, so he created other substances to make distinctions between the different created entities. In this sense, deity is totally separate and unique from anything or anyone created. Only God the Son and God the Holy Spirit share the divine essence of the Father, and this glorious essence is beyond the reach of any creature to understand. It is this separateness and uniqueness that gives God the attribute of holiness, as mentioned earlier in this video. Before there was a physical universe with the elements that make up matter, God created a spiritual reality called heaven. Heaven was populated with spirit beings, such as angels, cherubim, seraphim, and all ranks of created angelic beings. These beings are not physical beings made up of the elements we find in our physical reality. They were not made of matter in the sense we understand it. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught that there definitely is a difference between spiritual beings and physical beings. After he rose from the dead, he tried to reassure his disciples they were not seeing a ghost. Here is the account from the book of Luke. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. We can draw two conclusions from this passage. First, unlike spiritual beings, Physical beings can be experienced with the five physical senses. Jesus told them to touch him and see him, implying that if he were a ghost, they would not be able to see or touch him. Second, it is clear that spirits are not made of physical matter or flesh and bones. These two truths combined lead to the logical conclusion that immaterial beings that contain no matter cannot be seen or felt with the physical senses. As we shall see later in this video, beings of light do not interact at all with the Higgs field, so they go undetected in our matrix. The fact that the disciples could see Jesus and touch the wounds on his body was evidence that Jesus was not solely a spirit being. When we talk about the essence of God or what God is made of, we can only go by what the Bible tells us. Some theologians believe God is immaterial and not to be thought of as localized in a substance. To them, spirit is immaterial, ethereal, and completely different from matter we are familiar with in our physical universe. Others go as far to say that God is a supreme consciousness, which has no essence or physical reality at all. Theologians have their ideas, and Jesus had his idea. It was Jesus, in fact, who told us that God is pure spirit. The Apostle John recorded the words of Jesus. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. If anyone knows the essence or substance of God, it is Jesus who shared the essence and glory of God before the world began. We should take Jesus at his word and not try to overcomplicate this. Jesus did not go into greater detail about what spirit is, but this does not mean 
we need to insert our own human ideas into the definition. The same author, John, who recorded the words, God is spirit, also wrote in another letter, God is light, which was in 1 John. Now surely the same author would be aware of any distinction between these two concepts if there was such a distinction. To say that God is spirit is the same thing as saying God is light. However, God is not light in the sense that he is made of photons. I do not think it's biblically accurate to say that when John was saying God is light, he could also have been saying God is photons. There is a vast difference between the supernatural light of God's glory and electromagnetism. Another term the Bible uses for this spiritual light is called glory, and it is the glory of God that manifests as intense bright light. Now we are getting a clearer picture as to why humans and God cannot coexist. In our sinful dead state, the glory of God, which the Bible describes as unapproachable light, would destroy us if we came too close. Consequently, God distances himself from us to protect us. It must be very difficult for a loving father to have to keep a safe distance from the children he loves. So, it is easy to see why God had to plan a way to get us back. His love for us was too, too strong to allow the separation to continue for all eternity. God found a way to get us cleaned up, so to speak, and cleaned up enough to be able to exist in His glorious presence. But it took the blood of Jesus to do it. Now, because of the price Jesus paid by giving His own life in our place, we can be forgiven and made righteous in God's sight. We can now receive a new spirit that is fully alive with the life of God. This new spirit is one with the Holy Spirit and is the down payment on our inheritance and the only way possible we can ever hope to live in the presence of God for all eternity. If God had not made it possible for a human to receive a new spirit, all of humanity would be forever lost. Because no frail human spirit can exist in the intensity of God's glory. Without us becoming a new creation, God could not dwell in our beings because his glory would destroy us. A dead, sinful human creature cannot come in contact with the light energy of God's glory, or they will meet the same fate as the poor Levite who reached out to steady the Ark of the Covenant, only to be electrocuted. Before we can understand light, we first need to understand the basic ingredients of matter. Light is manufactured at the subatomic level, so it would benefit us greatly to understand how atoms work. Matter, which is made up of atoms, is defined as physical or corporeal substance in general, whether solid, liquid, or gaseous, especially as distinguished from incorporeal substance, as spirit or mind, or from qualities, actions, and the like, something that occupies space. Matter can even be invisible, like the air we breathe. In fact, all the matter we can see is actually made up of smaller bits of matter we can't see. Amazingly, the Bible told us this truth thousands of years ago. The writer of Hebrews wrote, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. How did the writer of Hebrews, who wrote the letter 2,000 years ago, know that everything we see in the universe is made out of things we can't see? Well, obviously, it was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Most people in America are required to take chemistry and physics in high school to fulfill graduation requirements. So it is pretty safe to assume that the majority of people watching this video are familiar with atoms. We've all seen the diagram showing an atom made up of protons and neutrons in the center called a nucleus. And we've all seen the electrons orbiting the nucleus, much like planets orbiting the sun. As we'll discuss later, this picture of the atom is actually not very accurate. Scientists now describe electrons as a wave in a mist or fuzzy cloud rather than a little ball of matter. High school students are also familiarized with the periodic table of elements and how different atoms, depending on the number of protons in the nucleus, 
form the different elements. Have you ever wondered where those elements come from? God created stars to not only create light and energy, but they are also factories that make elements. The core of a star is incredibly hot and dense, which creates the right environment for nuclear fusion. Hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, is the main ingredient of stars. Hydrogen is also the lightest element. It only has one proton and one electron. God created hydrogen atoms in such a way that they can be used to construct other pieces of matter but it takes incredibly hot, dense regions like that found in the center of stars. It takes four hydrogen atoms to make one helium atom. If two hydrogen atoms are moving fast enough from the intense heat, they can actually fuse together to create a heavier element, helium. If a star is massive enough, after it burns through all of the hydrogen in its core, it will then start to fuse the leftover helium atoms into carbon. This process will continue with the creation of an even heavier element, carbon and oxygen. An even more massive star will fuse these elements together, creating neon. The next phase will be neon into silicon, and if the star is very massive, it can fuse silicon into iron. Iron is the most stable element and can't be fused into anything heavier. Once the core of the star is solid iron, the star will die, and depending on the star's mass, it could die a violent death called a supernova or even become a black hole. There is a good possibility that we have not discovered every element in the universe. So when we talk about the substance or essence of God, we need to consider that perhaps there is a spiritual element that exists somewhere out there in the universe. The possibility of foreign elements is consistent with modern scientific observation. For example, Based on the movement of galaxies, planets, and other objects, scientists know that there must be something else out there that we can't see to account for the gravitational forces observed. They can calculate with amazing accuracy how gravity and motion interact. The mystery that has scientists baffled is the fact that all of the observable universe is not producing enough gravity to explain how objects move. They have concluded that there must be dark matter, to explain the strange phenomenon. Interestingly, this invisible matter actually makes up most of the universe. That means that we can't see or interact with most of the physical universe. If that is so, what makes us think we can see or interact with the spiritual realm? If we can't even see what we are made of, we have an even slimmer chance of seeing what God is made of. So now we are going to enter the realm of atoms which is an incredibly small realm. We're talking really, really small pieces of matter. And so how small are we talking here? Well, if it were possible to shrink to the size of an atom, you would have to shrink to 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. It is quite miraculous that something that small can maintain certain properties like spin, charge, and motion. The electron, for example, spins on an axis much like planet Earth spins on its axis, giving us day and night. And as electrons zig and zag around the nucleus, they do so at close to the speed of light. I challenge any scientist to create something as small as an electron, make it spin around an axis, and then keep it moving at close to the speed of light. And then, if you can create one electron, try to make trillions more, all spinning and moving at incredibly fast speeds, and then maintain that for billions of years. If you can do that, I'll come and worship at your feet, because only God can do something like that. Let me give you some mental pictures to help you wrap your mind around how incredibly small atoms are. Imagine an apple miraculously growing to the size of the earth. As the apple expands, the atoms that make up the apple also expand. To keep everything to scale, as the apple grows to the size of the earth, the atoms themselves would have to grow to the size of a real apple. Now imagine as this earth-sized apple shrinks, the trillions of apple-sized atoms have to shrink back to their original size. I don't know how many apples it would take to make a ball in the sky the size of the earth, but it's hard to imagine all of those apples shrinking enough to fill the space of one apple. 
Going even further, atoms are so tiny that one million of them lined up side by side would equal the thickness of a piece of paper. And one speck of dust contains up to three trillion atoms. It's almost too hard to believe that scientists even know about atoms or how to measure their mass and size considering their extremely small sizes. Amazingly, as small as atoms are, they are basically empty space. If we could blow up an atom to the size of the Earth, the nucleus would be a basketball in the center of the Earth with the electrons way out in the atmosphere and everything in between would be empty. Gerald Schroeder stated, if we could scale the center of an atom, the nucleus, up to four inches, the surrounding electron cloud would extend to four miles away, and essentially all the breach between would be marvelously empty. The solidity of iron is actually 99.99999% startlingly vacuous space made to feel solid by ethereal fields of force having no material reality at all. According to famous physicist Brian Greene, if the Empire State Building could be shrunk to eliminate all the free space between the atoms and all the free space within the atoms themselves, it would be the size of a grain of rice. So when we think of something being solid, we must realize that there really is no such thing. Solidity is an illusion brought on by invisible forces at the atomic level. Like charges repel, so this repulsion of charges is what gives us the impression something is solid. The reality is, the universe is made up of ghost-like particles that behave in very peculiar ways. The atom is truly a miraculous invention of Almighty God that shows a level of genius beyond anything we can comprehend. We take it for granted because we know about atoms, we study them, and we even know their properties like mass, weight, and spin. But it is one thing to know about atoms, and it is quite another to actually invent and create them and then sustain the process for eons of time. Humans have never even come close to inventing anything as small as the atom, yet there are arrogant scientists who deny the obvious truth that an intelligent mind put all of this together. Okay, so let's continue our journey into the subatomic realm. Atoms are by no means the end of the story when it comes to the smallest constituents of matter. In the 1960s, physicists discovered that the protons and neutrons that make up atomic nuclei are actually made up of smaller bits of matter called quarks. We would have to shrink to 10 to the minus 16 centimeters to enter the realm of these elementary particles. To give you an idea of how small quarks are, think of an electron being one centimeter long. A quark in comparison would be the size of the thickness of a single hair. Anything smaller than a quark has not yet been discovered. It is here where string theorists take the baton. As we probe deeper into the atom and examine the ingredients that are used to construct them, it becomes increasingly obvious that an intelligent mind created them. The smaller we shrink and the closer we get to the very substance of space, the more aware the universe seems to be. Just like programmers have created antivirus software to detect and remove a virus without the programmer having to actively be involved in the process, God programmed the universe with intelligence to operate without his undivided attention. God doesn't have to physically or even mentally make every electron in the universe move. All of the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, and other fields of science function according to the programs God wrote for them. He only had to write the program once and then step back to watch the universe unfold. One of the most fascinating discoveries to come from studying the subatomic realm is a strange phenomenon called the observer effect. The way elementary particles behave reveals that some intelligent mind must have programmed them with the ability to know when they are being looked at. Like sensors on floodlights that can be triggered by someone's presence, God created particles of matter with sensors to know when they are observed. The double slit experiment is a famous experiment that reveals the strange behavior of matter responding to observation. When physicists fire electrons through a screen with two slits, they expect two lines to form on the detector screen behind it. This reasoning seems logical because we would see that result 
if we fired marbles or BBs through a screen with two small slits. But there is a big difference between firing huge pieces of matter, relatively speaking of course, like marbles and firing incredibly small pieces of matter like electrons. The subatomic realm does not follow the same rules as the macro world and can indeed be rather spooky as Einstein labeled it. The results of the experiment actually show more than two lines on the detector screen, which means the electrons went through both slits at the same time as a wave. To explain how this works, look at the picture. The green light is emitted and travels as a wave. When the wave hits the two slits, two waves are created which disturb each other. The crest of one wave can meet the trough of another wave and cancel each other out, leaving a dark region on the detector screen where no wave hits. When the crest of one wave meets the crest of another, they combine and strengthen and leave a bright mark on the screen. When physicists discovered that a particle could travel through both slits at the same time, they decided to put a measuring device by the slits to see if they could catch the particle in its ghost-like state. Every time they went to observe what was happening, the wave property of the particle collapsed and formed a point-like particle. In other words, the electron or photon leaves as a particle, travels as a wave, but will then manifest as a particle when it is observed by a conscious being. Brian Greene wrote concerning this, Particle properties come into being when measurements force them to. When they are not being observed or interacting with the environment, particle properties have a nebulous fuzzy existence characterized solely by a probability that one or another potentiality might be realized. All of this seems to imply that matter has some form of intelligence. How does the particle know it is being observed? This raises some important questions. How did the universe exist before there were any conscious beings to look at it? How did matter exist? How were there planets, stars, galaxies, and other things if no one was around to look at it? Well, the answer is quite simple. Someone was looking at it. God is the ultimate observer. At the farthest reaches of the universe, God is observing how the universe unfolds. The Bible says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. As long as God is looking at the universe, it will exist in material form. God created humans like Him, so we share the ability to interact with matter at a conscious level. There is a time coming when God will stop observing the present order, and with one blink, everything in our universe will instantly change to the image He wants. At the resurrection, when Jesus returns to set up His earthly reign as King, the creation as it is now will drastically be changed. The Bible says, We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Peter actually wrote that on the day of the Lord, which is the day Jesus returns, the heavens will disappear. He wrote, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. In this split second, when God blinks, the material universe will dissolve or dematerialize and then rematerialize in a glorified state. Remember back from video one, I mentioned the thought I had of God's glory entering our atmosphere as I felt the intense Florida sunshine on my skin. From the above passage of scripture, we see this very thing as Jesus appears in glory and the atmosphere around him is ignited in glorious fire. The intense heat I felt that day as I walked on the beach is nothing compared to the brightness of God's glory. Jesus will appear in the fullness of his glory and nothing in the physical universe will be able to withstand that incredible light energy. It will be very similar to what we read in Exodus when the children of Israel saw Mount Sinai on fire and the atmosphere around the mountain had turned to thick dark clouds. But when Jesus appears, he will not hold back. Everything that has sin in it will be completely destroyed by the intensity of the glory. 
If the above information didn't blow your mind, then consider another fascinating aspect of the subatomic realm, namely, wave-particle duality. You might be puzzled over how electrons or other elementary particles can behave as a wave. Most of us were taught that electrons, protons, and other elementary particles exist as point-like particles, or little balls of matter. It is now believed that electrons and all elementary particles exist as some kind of wave in a quantum ocean. Here is Brian Greene's explanation. Thus, the success of quantum mechanics forces us to accept that the electron, a constituent of matter that we normally envision as occupying a tiny, point-like region of space, also has a description involving a wave that, to the contrary, is spread through the entire universe. And if this isn't strange enough, the waves that are spread throughout the entire universe are beyond the reach of scientists to study them. These elusive waves know when they are being looked at, so when scientists try to look at them, the waves collapse and present the particles. The next obvious question is, what is it that is waving? Physicists don't really know what the waves are or what they are made of because the waves will not allow anyone to see them. They do know that whatever this stuff is that is waving, it is not made up of the ingredients that make particles. The particles don't take on the substance of the waves and then manifest. In a truly miraculous fashion, the particles composed of entirely different ingredients, pop into existence out of this waving field only when they are observed. There are several phrases that have been adopted over the years to describe these waves. It is common to hear such terms as universal field, or field of intelligence, superstring field, and so forth, to describe this quantum motion. We will discuss the concept of fields later. But just know for now that this field has every possibility programmed into it. And as we'll discuss in a subsequent video, faith is using your God-given ability to tap into this realm where everything we need is already in existence in wave form. If you use your eyes of faith, you can look at these waves of potentialities, thus causing whatever it is that you need from God to manifest. There are countless videos on the internet that can help you see how this works. Just type double slit experiment in your internet search bar and you will find many helpful visual aids. In video three, we will begin our study on light.